church, of course, um, is an important topic, obviously, and it's called ecclesiology, is the uh, theological name for it, um, and we'll see why here in a second. A little better? All right, um, so the doctrine of the church, ecclesiology. We're going to do this in two parts today. We're going to start with what's called the marks of the church. Uh, and then we'll finish in the second half with kind of the nature and the purpose of the church. We're going to talk about both uh, the universal church, if you will, the, the, the big church, the one that all Christians belong to, both present and past. And then we'll also talk briefly about uh, the local church, um, that which we have been called to be a part of in our own context. So let's get at it. So the marks of the church. The church is one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. First things first, the Apostles' Creed, not written by the Apostles, but from the early Christian context, says this about the church. This is its line about the church. I believe in the one holy Catholic church. And as we're going to see in a minute, Catholic there doesn't mean Roman Catholic. And if you ever have me in session, and you mean to say the Roman Catholic church, and you say the Catholic church, uh, for those of you who have made that mistake, you know that I will correct you. Um, because, again, we can confess that we're all part of the one holy Catholic Church. The Nicene Creed, which was uh, developed and published, if you will, in 325, says, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. So they've added the word apostolic, right? So they saw something, they saw a need to say something uh, around its uh, apostolicity, which we'll also talk about what that is. And then the 39 articles, which I did not choose just because I'm an Anglican, although they, the 39 articles are the Anglican doctrinal statement. Uh, I chose it because it's from the Reformation period and it's very succinct. So from the 16th century now, the 39 articles of religion. The visible church of Christ is a congregation of faithful men and women in which the pure word of God is preached and the sacraments are duly ministered according to Christ's ordinance, and all those things that of necessity are requisite to the same. So the visible church, so notice it's, it's not talking just about this kind of universal sense of the church, but the visible church, the church that we can see, you'll know it's a true church when you see the word of God purely preached, when you see the sacraments duly administered according to Christ's ordinance, that means baptism in the Lord's Supper, those two and nothing more. The late medieval church had seven sacraments. The, Reformation, the reformer said there's two, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And then, and all those things that are uh, necessity are requisite to the same. So they're doing all those things to promulgate those two things. The preaching of the word, the celebration of baptism and the Lord's Supper. All right? So let's uh, get at it here. What's the church? Well, the Greek word that, where we get ecclesiology is because of the Greek word ecclesia. Now, uh, and, and, and here's the ways in which the word ecclesia is used in the New Testament. Now, some cried out one thing, some another. For the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. So, in secular Greek usage, the word ecclesia can simply designate a public assembly. And the New Testament still uses the word in that way some. So technically this morning, because we've gathered in a public assembly here, we're an ecclesia, according to secular Greek usage. And the New Testament retains that, for example, in Acts 19.32, when the word assembly is the word ecclesia. But they're not talking about a church here. They're simply talking about a group of people that have gathered together. You can see something similar in Acts 19.39, just seven verses later. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. Right? So again, the calling together of a group of people into assembly. And then same chapter, two verses later, and when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. Right? So initially, the Greek word ekklesia simply meant an assembly. In the Hebrew, ekklesia is uh, the Greek word kohal which designates, again, the assembling of God's people, an assembly of the people of God. And uh, that's, it's in Deuteronomy, it's in the Psalms, and other places. It's all over the Old Testament that this word, which the Septuagint, which is the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which happened in the intertestamental period. 
So if you're ever wondering like what's happening between Malachi and Matthew, one of the things that's happening is a group of people are translating the Hebrew scriptures into Greek, and it's called the Septuagint, abbreviated uh, as LXX because of the 70. Supposedly it was 70 translators working over a period of 70 days or something like that. So it's often called the LXX. All right, but in the Old Testament and in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, that is, translates Quahol uh, as both ekklesia and another word, synagoge, which is, of course, where we get the word synagogue from. All right. Even in the New Testament, again, ekklesia still signifies the assembly of the Israelites. There's a usage for that in Acts and one in Hebrews that when the New Testament talks about people assembling together, in two cases, it's talking about an assembly of Israelites, which is what Kohala would have originally referred to. But apart from these exceptions, and there's not many of them, the word ecclesia in the New Testament designates the Christian church, both the local church and the non-local church, which we would sometimes refer to as the universal church. So in the New Testament, ecclesia can refer both to an assembly of people, but that's not very common. More commonly, it always refers to either a local church, the church that is in Galatia, the ecclesia that is in Galatia, for example, or it refers to uh, the non-universal church, like in Acts 20, 28, where it's just making a reference to the church of Jesus Christ, not in a geographical place, but just generally talking about all believers in Jesus Christ. And the Greek word itself means, it comes from two words, ek kaleo, to call out. So literally, ekklesia means the called out ones. So our English word church means the called out ones. And what that means, of course, is just like any assembly, right? You're the called out ones on this campus this morning for this gathering, right? Because you're Tory freshmen or Tory sophomores, and so you've been called out into this assembly. And so ek Kaleo means to simply call out. So the church, those who have been called out by God to gather together, sometimes in a specific place like Galatia, and then sometimes just the called out ones who gather together in general. All right? Well, that's the word church. So that's where we get our English word church. Let's talk about, come back now to those marks of the church. One, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. So there's Tons of references in the New Testament to the unity or the oneness of the church of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 30, and I'm not, I'm not going to flash all these up for you, but uh, we don't have time to read them all. But in 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 30, Paul warns against divisions in the church and urges the people to be united in Christ. So if you recall, you're reading of 1 Corinthians, right? It's a uh, it's a, it's a church. There's a church there in Corinth, but the members are acting quite uh, poorly at times and are not unified with one another. There's a disunity in the church. So Paul warns them against these divisions. So obviously, if you're warned against divisions, the ideal then is to be united to one another. It's to be one. In 1 Corinthians 12, so later in the same book, and again in Romans 12, Paul states that while there are many gifts, there is one body. So we're probably familiar with that, right? The spiritual gifts passage. So although there's many gifts, there's one body. So it's all meant to come together and work together to, to be one functional whole, right? It would be unfortunate, and I'm sure there's people in the world who struggle with this, um, and there are certainly people, but it would be terrible if you could not control, right, an arm or something like that, that you would have no control over it. That would be very frustrating to not be able to control our own bodies. And so it's similar in the church that all these gifts focus in on one purpose, and that's the unity of the body of Christ. John 10, 16 speaks of the one shepherd and the one flock, right? So it just takes for granted that Jesus Christ is the one shepherd, God's the one shepherd, and there's one flock, and that is the church. Jesus prays that his followers may be one, even as he um, and the Father are one in John 17, and so just had the Johnson House students the other day talking about this a bit. So again, the, there's a great call for unity there in John 17, right? I mean, it's, it's a serious unity. Jesus says, hey, the way in which the Father and I are one, I want you all to be one. Well, I mean, think about that statement, right? I mean, the Father and the Son, they're one in ways that we have no idea how they're actually one, right? We confess it. 
but we can't understand it. I mean, that's, that's inter-Trinitarian relationships. But Jesus says that unity is the unity you're supposed to have as believers. So I take that just real quickly to mean this. We can't just simply like one another. I mean, there's some of you I don't know, so for all I know, I don't even like you. And vice versa, right? I mean, you might not be a person that's very likable. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> no, really, truly, no, just kidding. Um, so the church has to be more than just saying, well, we all get along, we like one another. And if we don't, I'll find a new one until I can find a church where I like everyone and they like me. No, the unity Jesus is talking about goes beyond like or goes beyond, I can, I can at least get along with this person well enough to be in church with them. It's a real unity. It's an ontological unity. The unity that the Father shares with the Son is the same unity that we're supposed to have in the church. All right? So that's huge. A lot we could say there. We've already talked about that with some of the uh, sophomores in Johnson House. So. But anyway, so it's a real unity, right? Not just, hey, look, we get along. We're kind of the same but instead connected in our very being. And then finally in Galatians, uh, Paul declares that in Christ all are one with no distinction of race, social status, or sex, or gender, right? So there's no longer slave, nor Jew, nor Greek, nor free, et cetera, et cetera. We're all one. There's such a unity in the church that it breaks down those barriers that we have that are, that are manifested in an exterior way. And then finally, Acts 2, 42 and 4, 32 are testimonies to the oneness of the church. Remember these passages? And they were, upper, they were in the upper room together. They had all things in common, breaking bread with one another and listening to the apostles' teaching. Right? So literally, after Christ ascended to heaven, we have uh, the early church coming together, unified in their purpose, unified together in their worship, demonstrating the unity that they actually had. So again, unity is all over the New Testament, but... Probably the most powerful set of verses to speak to this comes from Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility gentleness, and gentleness, with patience, showing forbearance to one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. So just real quick, that language there with which you have been called, remember the called out ones, ex kaleo, right? We've been called um, to this by God. There is one body and one spirit, just as also you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Notice all those ones. Right? We have one Lord. We have one faith. We demonstrate our, our Christian faith through one baptism. So even though we might go to different churches on a Sunday, the church itself is one. Right? We're not going to different churches and worshiping different lords. At least I hope not. If you are, you're in a cult, by the way, uh, or a false church. You should probably get out of it. But, uh, but again, this unity is actually evidenced through the things that we do as the church. So I think Paul really gets at that there. I mean, this great passage in Ephesians about calling. If you think about Ephesians 1, before the foundations of the wor world, God set us apart. And what did he set us apart to? He set us apart to be this unity. All right? So this is getting away a little bit from thinking individualistically about our faith. Well, God called me, and it's thinking in terms of God called us. Right? So... I, singular, am only part of this bigger thing, the church, which is also one together. So we are intimately connected one to another even before we ever knew one another. Okay, so one and holy. Uh, the one part I think it's easier to get. We all think, yeah, yeah, the church is a unity. I get that. I can wrap my head around it. But the church is also holy. Oh, and by the way, even though we can kind of get our head around unity... You know, it still leaves the question sometimes. It's like, yeah, but, but I think, Dr. Peters, what you do at church is different than what I do. Unity does not demand uniformity. Okay? Unity does not demand uniformity. So think about this even in a Tory group. We ask you to work together as one group. Right? We don't want half the circle being on one project and half being on another project. Or at least that's what we strive not to have that problem. Right? But that's not saying leave your personality at the door and just come in and be blah Tory student, right? 
we all know your personalities if we've had you enough. All right? We, we know, like, oh, if I do this, this person is going to do something like this. Right? So, again, unity does not demand uniformity in the church. All right? Holiness. To be holy is to be separated from what is profane and to be dedicated to the service of God. It does not mean that the Christian is free of sin. Christians are holy in that they are separated for God's service and set apart by God. 1 Corinthians, we've already talked about, but remember the Christians there were guilty of several things. Let me just name some of the things the Christians in Corinth were guilty of. Incest, it's a bad sin. Suing one another in the pagan courts, that didn't look good, right? You don't look like a unity when you're suing one another in pagan courts. They were defrauding each other just kind of actively in the business of defrauding one another. And there were some people in that church having sexual relationships with prostitutes. This is a nightmare for a pastor, right? I mean, this is like not a good church. So the church in Corinth doesn't seem very holy just as we read 1 Corinthians. In Rome, the weak Christians were judging the strong Christians, and the strong Christians despised the weak Christians. So that's Romans 14. So in the church in Rome, there's some Christians who are just more mature, uh, a little more able to follow Christ, called the strong Christians, if you will. And they did not like the weak Christians, right? So the weak Christians would say, I don't think you're supposed to drink. And the strong Christians would say, the Bible never says I can't, well, they didn't have the Bible. Uh, it's probably okay if I drink for these reasons. But, you know, Paul says, hey, strong Christians, don't make the weak Christians stumble, and da 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 So again, they're not on the same page. Various solutions have been proposed in the history of the church to reconcile the fact that the Holy Church is actually a sinful church. So let me say that again. Think about this. The Holy Church is actually a sinful church. So what does that, what does that mean? I mean, that sounds counterintuitive, right? Well, the solution, I think, is again an awareness of what holy means in the Bible. This is what I think holiness means in the Bible. Again, to be holy is to be separated from what is profane and to be dedicated to the service of God. It does not mean that the Christian is free from sin. Christians are holy in that they are separated for God's service and set apart by God. So 1 Thessalonians 2, 13 says this, But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation, through sanctification by the Spirit, and faith in the truth. So again, we have been called out by God to be sanctified in His Spirit. That, that's part of our calling as the church, part of our calling as Christians, is to actually be holy. And then, um, sorry about that, I could have put that up for you. And then Colossians 3.12, And so, as those who have been chosen of God, and this is the kicker, so, hey, you... As those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved. Put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Paul is not saying to the Colossians here, if you're compassionate, if you're kind, if you're humble, if you're gentle, if you're patient, then you'll be holy. Right? That's not what Paul says. Paul actually is saying that those who have been chosen by God, remember, called by God, ex kaleo, called out, those who have been called by God, chosen by God, are holy and beloved. So we are holy even though we're not sinless. All right? So sinless, which may or not be possible in this life, and the next session I think is on uh, those questions maybe, um, we are certainly holy in spite of it. And again, we're individually holy and corporately holy as well. All right? So we could talk more about that. Maybe we'll have questions at the end about that piece. But so we're one. We're united together. We're holy, even though we're not sinless. And the church is Catholic. Our English word Catholic comes from the Latin word Catholicus, which comes from this Greek word, which has been messed up. That is not a Greek word there. It just has now reminded me that I do not have my proper Greek font installed. So, um, but Catholicos is the Greek word. Um, and then uh, that means universal. That was its meaning as a word in ancient Greek usage, right? 
So the word Catholic, again, derives from this Latin word Catholicus, which comes from Catholicos, which is Greek, meaning universal. To speak of the Catholicity of the Church is to refer to the entire Church, which is universal and which has a common identity of origin, lordship, and purpose. So the Catholic Church, right, we have one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. So we have a common origin, a common lordship. And as well, we have a common purpose, which we'll get to uh, by the end of our time together today. So the church is universal in that we share those things. The church at any place and at any time in its history has had those things in common. A common origin, a common lordship, a common purpose. So while the local church is an entire church, so wherever you go, First Baptist Church of whatever, that church is the entire church. But it's not the entire church, of course, right? I mean, I, I hope you don't go to a church that thinks just those 200 people getting together in Anaheim equals the Church of Jesus Christ. Again, you might want to leave that <laughs> church. Um, but uh, the local church is the entire church, while at the same time it's part of the universal church, the bigger entire church. As Catholic, the church includes believers of past generations and believers of all cultures and societies. So the Catholicity is not just talking about that we're somehow connected to all believers that are living today at this very moment we're actually also connected to every believer who's ever lived at any time in any place. So the Catholicity is not just about the horizontal level of the Christian church today. It's about the horizontal and the vertical aspect of the church. Right? So we're in communion with the Apostle Paul. We're in communion with John Calvin. We're in communion with John Wesley. We're in communion with fill in the blank. Right? Anyone who's ever lived and has been a believer and has been a member of the church, we are in communion with those people. And that's what Catholicity is getting to when it says universal. The church that has existed at all times and all places. So we're one, holy, and Catholic. And so the reason in session, if you say Catholic when you mean Roman Catholic, I will correct you. Right? Because when I hear you say Catholic church, I'm thinking, right, the Catholic church which we're all a part of. But if you mean Roman Catholic, you need to put that adjective on there, Roman, okay? And if you forget to do it, I'll be relentless. Uh, anyway, so you'll know it as soon as you make that mistake. And then uh, finally, the, the apostolic nature, one holy Catholic and apostolic. Ephesians 2, 19 and 20. You are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So we're fellow citizens with all the saints, and by saints there, it doesn't mean the, the people who have died and someone decided they should be called a saint. Saints in, in Pauline language is all believers. So we are fellow citizens with all the believers, so that's actually a reference to the Catholicity of the church, and we're members of the household of God, and what are we constructed upon? Like, what makes this a sure and stable foundation, right? None of us wants to move into a, you know, what if you showed up to attend Biola and, you know, they walked you over to your dorm and your dorm was kind of the leaning tower of Biola, you know, and it was kind of cattywampus like this and there were big cracks in the whole, you know, in the walls of your room and you thought, yeah, this is a great idea. I'm in an earthquake prone region in a building that's li listing to the left, you know? Like, you're not going to go in there. You're going to say, the thing's going to fall on me if we get an earthquake, right? So, the church also needs to have that sure foundation, right, so that we're not off kilter. And that sure foundation is the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. It's their teaching. What were the believers doing in the upper room after Jesus' ascension? Devoting themselves to prayers, the breaking of bread, probably hearing the, the Hebrew scriptures read, and to the apostles' teaching. So apostolicity is not to a claim that there's a direct line of succession through specific individuals. There are church traditions that teach that apostolic succession is about the apostle Peter laid his head on, or hand on someone's head, and then that guy laid his hand on someone's head, and you go down through the generations, and voila, here we are. It doesn't have to necessarily mean that. Rather, the apostolicity of the church is to recognize that the message and the mission of the apostles, as mediated through the scriptures, must be that of the whole church. 
So the church must be a people of the book, because the scriptures that is, because that is the teaching of the apostles and the prophets, and that's what we want to be built on. So if you come from a church tradition that doesn't have this kind of sense of passing down the tradition through the process of, say, ordination, that's okay. You're still part of an apostolic church as long as you're faithful to the teaching of the apostles and the prophets. So, for example, in the Anglican tradition, we, we believe that we have an unbroken line of succession back to the apostles. And I say we believe because there's no way to prove that. Right? I can't prove that the person who ordained me had been ordained by a person who had been ordained by a person. Da, 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 da. Oh, Peter. <laughs> right? I mean, it's just, I mean, historically you can't prove that, but that doesn't matter. That doesn't make a church not apostolic as long as it's holding to the apostolic faith. So we one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. And these are called the marks of the church. Right? So it's, it's what we've confessed from uh, the early church and the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, uh, and it's what you oftentimes find in the Reformation creeds and Reformation confessions, the one holy Catholic apostolic, and as you've seen, it's biblical. No one's making this up as we go. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.